Okay, so now we're moving um, kind of, I guess, to an intersection between cognitive development and social development. And that's the issue of how our level of moral reasoning changes as we get older. So Hans Kohlberg uh, proposed, you can see back in the 1960s, that as we develop cognitively, our moral reasoning also changes. And he proposed six distinct stages uh, for the purposes of the quiz, um, I, I think it's really only necessary to understand the three basic stages or, or levels, um, the pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. Um, so I'm going to speak on these briefly. Uh, they're also discussed in your textbook. And then I want to present to you a moral reasoning problem. And I want you to consider how a person in uh, one of those levels would respond to the problem. And that's actually going to be the topic of your second discussion board forum. The way that Kohlberg researched his ideas on moral development is he created um, basically a, a moral problem. Uh, the problem that he used was um, people were supposed to imagine that there was a woman who was deathly ill and there was only one type of medication that could cure her. The only person that had that medication, there was one pharmacist in town, and he was charging an outrageous amount of money. Now, the woman's husband um, went to the pharmacist and tried to bargain with him. The pharmacist said, no, either you pay me this ridiculous sum of money or you don't get the, uh, the drug. And then the moral question that Kohlberg would pose to people is, would this man be, would it be morally right for this man to steal the medication? Now, this was purposely an ambivalent question where it wasn't really clear if the right answer, the morally correct answer was yes or no. And actually, Kohlberg didn't really care if people said yes, he should steal or no, he shouldn't steal. What he really wanted to know was the reasoning behind that answer. And so uh, when he looked at things, he found that when people are fairly young and they're in the pre-conventional phase, which more or less corresponds to Piaget's uh, pre-operational stage, um, he found that children were very much focused on themselves and if they would put themselves in that man's position, what would happen to them? Um, so the focus is on avoiding punishment, personal punishment. And so here you have kind of the classic low-level reasoning of, am I going to get caught? If I get caught and I get punished, well, then it's morally wrong. If I can escape getting caught and I don't get punished, then it's morally right. Now, hopefully none of you are still reasoning in that way for the most part, but I think that's a tempting line of thought. It's very simple, and so that would be stage one. With stage two, the focus is on self-interest. So in that case, a child might either say, oh my goodness, I would feel so guilty if I stole. No, it would be morally incorrect to steal because they're very much focused on what would happen to them. On the flip side, a child might say, oh my goodness, I would just feel absolutely terrible if my wife died, so it would be perfectly fine for me to steal. So you see, it doesn't really matter if they say yes or no. All that matters is what is their reasoning? Are they focusing on avoiding punishment? Are they focusing on what would happen to them? If so, Kohlberg said they were in the pre-conventional phase. Now, as we get a bit older and we hit those later elementary school years, basically corresponding to Piaget's concrete operational phase, uh, Kohlberg said that then a person reaches this conventional stage. He also, through his research, made the argument that most people remain at the conventional phase, that even many adults are still here. And quite frankly, most of us, our moral reasoning is very much governed by the rules and the laws of our society. So uh, just to backtrack, if somebody was in stage three right here, the focus is on maintaining connections with other people, family and relationships. So with that um, example that I gave you, if somebody said, oh my goodness, he, it would be absolutely fine if he stole because that's going to enable him to stay close with his wife and that's what's most important. 
well, then they would be a stage three. Um, on the flip side, if they said, oh, goodness, if he stole, that would ruin his position in the community. The, uh, the grocer would totally trash him. He would be an outcast. That is also going to be a stage three because it's preserving those um, community ties. So stage four is probably the easiest way to reason, and I think that's why so many people find themselves at this point. Um, it's all about what is the law. And so actually in this case, what is morally correct is very easy to answer. It's illegal to steal. It's against the law. And so therefore, it would be morally wrong for him to actually steal. The so stage four is really straightforward. Now what Colbert noted is that there were some gender differences and some culture differences. Women were more likely to be at stage three. Men were more likely to be at stage four. We also see, as you might imagine, that collectivist cultures are more likely to reason at three. Um, whereas individualist cultures are slightly more likely to be at four. And there's been some debate over whether four is necessarily more mature, more well-developed than stage three. Uh, many modern, peop uh, modern researchers say no, that they are basically equivalent in terms of developmental level. Now, a few people um, do actually, I guess, graduate to the post-conventional phase. Initially, Kohlberg argued that this would be corresponding to Piaget's uh, formal operations, the abstract thinking point. Um, but there are many people who are in formal operations who are still reasoning at the conventional phase. But with stage five, um, it's really about kind of a utilitarian perspective. What is best for society as a whole? And I guess you would have to decide, is it best for society if we save this woman? Or is it best for society if he doesn't steal? And that's really up to you. Um, and then stage six, Kohlberg argued, is I guess the, the highest level, most mature, most in-depth reasoning, and very, very few people get here. And this is where you come up with some kind of universal ethical principle. So the principle might be, one should never ever steal in which case, of course, it's morally wrong to take that medication. On the flip side, the universal ethical principle might be do whatever it takes to restore the life of an ill person, in which case, of course, it's, it's morally required that he steal that. Um, so I've tried to give you sort of the answers to an example because on the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, another example, and I want you to consider um, how a person in a pre-conventional phase conventional phase and a person who's in the post-conventional phase would respond to that. All right, so go ahead and in a minute here I'm going to, well I guess I'll just do it now. You see the moral dilemma right here. Perhaps you want to pause this, read over it, and then rewind the video so you're actually on that slide, and then go ahead and go to the discussion board forum. And I'm going to go ahead and move on. All right. So now I'm moving into social development, and what I'm really focusing on is attachment. And this issue of attachment is something that it develops in us at a very young age. And our level of attachment, um, as it's developing in infancy, actually seems to predict the quality of our attachment in adulthood. So for the third, dis third and final discussion board forum, what I'm asking you to consider is how these youthful attachment issues might impact a person in adulthood. If you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to stop this video, go ahead and look at the videos of Harlow, uh, Harry Harlow's research. Um, so take that time, do that, and then come back. All right, hopefully you had a chance to look at that. And I want you to give some thought to these questions that I have up here. If we were in class, I'd have you do a little discussion on it. Um, and I do want you to actually give it some thought before you advance uh, to the next slide where I talk about it in a little bit more detail. Think about those baby monkeys and what their life must have been like as adults. So they were raised with no real um, provider, no real care provider to give them that sense of attachment and connectedness. Because even though that cloth mother was soft, she wasn't giving the um, kind of give and take that a normal caregiver would provide. So how do you think those baby monkeys, as they got to adulthood, responded to stress? Do you think they responded pretty well, or do you think they might have had problems? How do you think they responded to potential mates? 
Harlow actually did a study where he brought in sexually receptive adult female monkeys, and all the ones in the experiment were male. Do you think they were interested in mating? And then also, um, in later research when he had female monkeys um, who were exposed to this same kind of lack of attachment, when they grew up, he gave them um, infant monkeys to care for. How do you think they did then as, as mothers, as parents? Um, so uh, I'm not going to worry too much about those bottom questions, but I want you to give some thought to those three. Maybe even pause the video, think to yourself, look at the textbook a little, and then uh, carry on. Okay, so I want to point out that when Harlow was doing this original research, which probably to you, like to me, seems just like cruel and unnecessary research to be performing, but at the time, um, researchers and, uh, and parents alike were uh, somewhat of the belief that if you were overly affectionate with your child, you were spoiling them and you were going to cause them to be really dependent upon you. Um, and so Harlow's research, even though it was really severe and perhaps hard to watch, um, what it showed us is that caregivers and the provision of love and attachment to a child is absolutely fundamentally important for that child's healthy development. We also understand through Harlow's research and later work that infants will form attachments instinctively to any consistent caregiver. It used to be thought that it was only the mother, but of course now we know it's a mother, a father, a nanny, an adoptive parent, anyone who is available to the child, who is responsive and sensitive to their needs, uh, that child is going to form a healthy attachment. Another thing that might be especially good to hear for uh, working parents who don't spend as much time with their child as perhaps they'd, they'd like to is that it seems to be more about the quality of the interaction rather than the quantity. It's really more about how you are interacting with your child rather than the sheer number of hours that you spend together. Now, I asked you before to consider how those baby monkeys responded when they grew up. And what Harry Harlow actually found is that those monkeys were horrible at responding to stress. When a stressful situation occurred, um, they tended to go into a corner, they would go into the fetal position, they would rock, they would bang their heads, they would hit the, the cages. They acted just, just really poorly. They were unable to handle the stress. This taught us the fact that a healthy attachment is absolutely fundamental for providing us with some basic coping strategies. And so Harlow and later research has demonstrated for us that when you have a good attachment system and your caregiver is available, kind of like the little monkey that was able to attack um, the uh, really sort of grotesque monster that was presented to him, when the caregiver is present, the infant is much more relaxed, they're free to explore, and they're better able to cope with stress. So far from the caregiver making the child dependent, Having a good attachment actually enables the child to have a really solid foundation from which they can, they can spring, they can jump, they can fly, they can do new things. However, if the caregiver is not very respons responsive to the child's needs, um, the child is going to be very, very clingy. And I think probably we've all seen this at the grocery store. The parent who is too busy texting on the cell phone to respond to their child, the child starts to really melt down because all they want is that sense of connection to their parent and the parent is unresponsive. So just to reiterate, a healthy attachment is really about the quality of the interaction. Is the parent being responsive to the child's needs? Now, of course, this doesn't mean you need to do everything they want to do, but it does mean setting healthy boundaries, being available when your child needs you, when your child is upset, um, I was very impressed one time, I was sitting with a friend of mine, visiting with her, and she's a child psychologist, and her five-year-old was needing attention, or at least he felt he needed attention. And he came over to us, you know, Mommy, Amanda, Amanda, Mommy, I want, let me show you this, and, you know, really bugging us. And finally my friend turned to him and said, this is Mommy's time with her friend. Let's go ahead and set a timer, and she set the timer for five minutes, when that timer goes off, 
we will play with you. But until that timer goes off, you need to give us some time. And so surely what he did was he went ahead and played, and as soon as that timer came off, he brought his toy back to us. So this is a way where if you give a child some clear expectations, and this kind of goes back to the conditioning thing, if we know exactly what to expect and we're consistent with it, then our children are going to be much better able to handle things. And if we are responsive to their needs, um, or we let them know when we will be responsive to them and that we follow through, it's going to be a healthy attachment. So I mentioned back on the Harlow slide that when the caregiver is around, and if we're talking about a caregiver where the child has a good attachment, um, what ends up happening is the child feels free to explore because they have that nice solid home base to come back to. Uh, we also see that the child is going to have higher self-esteem, higher confidence, and they're going to be much better able to deal with stressors in their lives. However, when we have a caregiver who's not responsive, this goes back to the grocery store example, the child is going to be very clingy and very needy and very seeking of attention. Um, at least that's in the youth. As they get older, the child who doesn't have a very responsive caregiver um, is eventually going to be fairly avoidant. They're not going to seek out loved ones. Which kind of gets me back to one of the questions I asked you about Harlow's research. Um, Harlow's monkeys, when they grew up, made for horrible mates. They were abusive to the female monkeys that were shown to them, or they tried to mate in really bizarre uh, ways. Um, so if we don't have good attachment when we're young, we don't know how to effectively attach when we are older. And that goes not just for mates, but also for children. When those female monkeys in Harlow's study grew up, when they were given babies, they either ignored them or they reacted violently towards them. And so we kind of see this playing out in humans as well. People who grow up in a situation with um, a lack of a good solid caregiver, as they grow up and have children, they are horrible parents who either ignore their children or who respond with a lot of cursing, very short tempered, not able to deal with um, the stress of having a child. Um, so this early life attachment is incredibly important. All right, so I was saying in that previous slide, that the way that we attach when we are young has a big impact on the way that we attach when we are older. Now the vast majority of people have a secure attachment when they're young and that enables them to be fairly secure when they are in adulthood. And what I'd like for you to do is to look at this, I'm, I'm going to go over this chart briefly, and then also take a look on the videos at the strange situation task. And this was a task that uh, Ainsworth created to assess a child's quality of attachment to their caregiver. She had originally only measured mothers, but we now know that any consistent caregiver, um, that a child can form a good attachment with them. So somebody, a child who is secure, um, is certainly going to be very happy playing with mom. I'm just going to default to mom here. Playing with mom when she's around. When mom leaves, the child is very upset because here they're still in that stranger anxiety phase. Um, a stranger is not going to be able to comfort them. But when mom comes back, oh goodness, oh, everything is better now. And so once mom is back, the child just goes back to playing with toys and exploring the room. That's secure. Ainsworth then noticed uh, something that she referred to as avoidant attachment. So with this child, this has probably been a parent who has not been very responsive to the child and they haven't formed much of an attachment at all. And so not surprisingly, when that mom leaves, eh, the kid really doesn't care. They don't show uh, much emotion when mom leaves. And when mom returns, eh, really not a big deal. But because that child doesn't have good attachment, they also don't seem to be very good at exploring. They don't have that solid base or solid foundation. So the quality of their play, the number of toys they're looking at, how they're playing with those toys is very simple and very low level. The third attachment style that she noted, she called ambivalent attachment. So ambivalent, just as a word, simply means that you could kind of go either way. 
ambidextrous, for instance, means you are equally comfortable using your right or your left uh, hand to write with. So that ambi means I can go either way. For this child, mom is good, but she's not that much better than anybody else that's around. So when mom leaves, the child's going to be sad, but a stranger easily comforts the child. Now, when mom comes back, the child either shows that she really doesn't care that mom is back, um, or she might be angry and really not show much of a connection to mom. Um, but see, we, we also see that this child, even though she's not paying attention to mom, she's also not paying attention to her toys or to exploring the room. And that's because this is the child that is very concerned with, is mom paying attention to me? So the avoidant child really doesn't care that mom's not around or paying attention. The ambivalent child kind of acts a little bit like they don't care, but is going to alternate also with mommy, 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 just really being preoccupied with connecting with mom. And the book talks more about these three stages. What I want you to consider in the discussion board forum is how might a person in each of these stages act when they get to be an adult. So somebody who has an avoidant attachment, what might they look like in adulthood as compared to somebody who has a secure attachment? All right, so that does it for this week's videos. Next week, we'll pick up with social development and we'll get into adolescence and adulthood.